I want to give you a discussion assignment on performance art and also talk about celebrities in art. And both of these lectures are not totally inclusive. Uh, they are taking kind of various threads that I've found and then showing you some of the stuff that maybe I have seen from them. And I'm curious what your opinions are. I thought you might find performance art kind of interesting as a form of art because it's not theater. It's not acting in a film. It's something completely different. And then I also thought you might find it interesting to look at some celebrities and how do actors and musicians make art? How are they good at it? And we'll see a little bit of what I found. So there was an article several years ago that I read talking about celebrity artists. Should they be included in the art world? And I began kind of watching there, kind of from that article, I began to kind of watch and see what I was seeing with this going on. And also because a really well-respected curator from the Museum of Contemporary Art MOCA, Paul Schimmel, was fired from the influence of Eli Broad, probably, because he wasn't the guy that was out making a lot of money for MOCA glad-handing. He was a serious curator. And so after that, they replaced him with a curator named Jeffrey Deitch. And Deitch had been in New York and had been showing uh, street art and celebrity artists and stuff like that and doing pretty well. And it was thought that he would bring some new kind of electricity to LA art. And it didn't do that well. Uh, he didn't last very long. And he was showing actors and actors were having more access to curating art and stuff in this really well-respected contemporary art museum. And in LA, we kind of like to keep Hollywood separate from our art because Hollywood is part of everything else. So the images that I'm showing you here, this is from a gallery called Blum and Poe. Blum and Poe are a great gallery in Culver City. Highly recommend going to shows there. Big gallery. Uh, Blum is the son of Irving Blum, who started the Cool School, someone else I'll talk about in another lecture. And they have been showing really important art, especially art from Japan and China, uh, for a long time. Now, this particular show here was a private exhibition of a sculpture that Kanye West had made. He didn't make it himself, much like other artists in the 20th century. He had an idea, and then he had craftspeople build his idea, and we would give credit to the person who comes up with the idea in the art world. So they had Kanye West sculpture, and they did it in between two shows because they didn't want to alienate all the serious art goers who would really be put off if Kanye West was given a show. And it, let me put it to you like this. Artists spend their whole life trying to get into a gallery like Blum and Poe and slowly work up through the ranks. Whereas Kanye West is not famous for being an artist. He's famous because he's a great musician. Uh, maybe he's also famous as a provocateur as well now. But it's different to go to see art done by, because, done by someone because you know them as an actor or a director or as a musician than someone who just makes art. And I'm trying to figure out what are the differences in the art as well. So here we see that show. We see the Kardashians in these pictures. Kanye was on tour. We see him in the bottom image. Uh, on a tablet. This is when him and Kim Kardashian were married. So this sculpture is a giant bed with Kanye and Kim sleeping in the middle. Next to them are their former lovers, Ray J for Kim. And then next to them are other artists. There's Taylor Swift, Swift. there's Rhiannon. You see Donald Trump in the foreground here. Bill Cosby is over on the other side of the bed. 
the first, uh, the President George Bush is in the bed. So what we're seeing is, uh, and also they're highly realistic sculptures that have motors in them that make them appear that they're breathing and they're alive. So this was used for a video called Famous. And the sculpture, when it's in the context of the gallery, obviously is art as well. And what we're seeing here is the idea that when you're famous, you are in bed with everybody, both literally and figuratively. I think it's a pretty good work of art. Critic Jerry Saltz, the article I was talking about on celebrities in art. Jerry Saltz writes for New York Magazine. He's a graduate of Yale. He says that art and celebrity collide with one another in the age of Instagram and digital media. He says there are plenty of room for celebrities like Kanye West, who he considers an artist, or Kim Kardashian, who he doesn't consider an artist, but she's culturally important. And by culturally important, I mean everybody knows who she is. So the questions are, do we let celebrities into the art world because art should indeed be open and anyone should be allowed to be an artist if they're good? Or are we letting the celebrities in because they don't threaten the established hierarchy that Jerry Saltz is a part of? So by having a Kanye West come in, it certainly is not threatening the major artist there because he's in that show as a kind of curiosity. What are some of the differences that we find in actors and performance artists? The top image at MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the maybe is presented by Tilda Swinton, and she's a great actress. She comes in whenever she feels like it, and she's wearing the same clothes, and she gets into the bed inside of the glass cube, and she either sleeps or pretends to sleep. And people with smartphones and spectators are able to post uh, images of her and be close to their star, yet a wall of glass separating them. I remember seeing this piece and really thinking that this was very similar to the art of Chris Burden. Chris Burden is a performance artist. He's also the sculptor that did Urban Lights at the LA County Museum of Art. And he, in 1972, in his bed piece, he gets in bed and stays there for 22 days. This is not something that he does kind of part-time. This is a full-time thing. Chris went to UCI. He did really dangerous performances in the early part of his career. He taught at UCLA, and he's considered one of the innovators in performance art. Here's what he says about his bed piece. piece for the Market Street program from February 18th to March 10th. I told him I would need a single bed in the gallery. At noon on February 18th, I took off my clothes and got into bed. I hadn't given any other instructions, and I did not speak to anyone during the piece. On his own in initiative, Josh Young had to provide food, water, and toilet facilities. I think that was part of the piece, the fact that they had to deal with me simultaneously as an object and a person. I remained in bed for 22 days. I'm including this piece because, first, it's an example of the kind of piece I talked about in the introduction. I hadn't planned to film it. The film exists as a pure accident, which I managed to get a hold of. I'm also including it to offset the more dramatic pieces in this tape. I don't know whether the energies of this piece can be successfully transmitted on tape but to me this piece remains in my mind as one of the strangest and most interesting piece that I've ever done at first it was very hard the first two days were very boring very painful and I realized I wasn't anywhere near the end and I didn't see how how I could go on. But by the end or the middle of the second week, I had begun to establish a routine and I began to sort of enjoy it there. 
my days were very full, very rich, and I had a very peaceful feeling. And as the peace neared, neared ending, near closing, I started feeling uh, regret about leaving. I started feeling like I wanted to stay. And I actually considered staying, but I knew that if I stayed, that, that I would be forced to leave anyway, and that people would have would consider me crazy. I mean, I knew that that they were going to end it for me. But but the fact that I was tempted and that that I was very seduced into it, to me, that is the strangest part about this piece. S some of the energy, I think, of what was going on in my head was sort of conveyed to, to the other people. I had a strange power around me, sort of like a, a bubble or a repulsive magnet. Most people wouldn't come close to me. In, in fact, most people seem, seem frightened. So you get a sense from Chris that this was not an easy thing to do. It seems like what Tilda did, it was a lot easier. So this is what performance artists are all about. They are about doing these things that are dangerous, are painful, and that a live audience must see. And whether or not they exist in video or photographic form, sometimes is an accident. Whereas the whole reason that an actor in a film exists is for it to be recorded. And usually there's no script. And that's the difference between theater. James Franco. So James Franco is an actor who has been disgraced because of his behavior. He, wa he went to NYU, uh, probably graduated and got into NYU because he was a well-known actor. He, at one point, is copying, appropriating. Remember, we studied appropriation art. Why can't actors do appropriation art? Well, it goes back to, well, what should you appropriate? So Cindy Sherman, who we've studied, she did these untitled stills. These untitled stills were made between 1977 and 1980. She is making stills that she's starring in as characters in films that were never made. So these are not actual real films, but they are the kind of publicity photos that you might see for noir films in the 1940s detective films that have pretty limited roles for women. Basically, women were either the femme fatale or they were the damsel in distress or they were the sassy reporter. And, you know, very limited range. And I think Cindy's kind of showing us that limited range somewhat in her photographs. James appropriates the images and copies the images, but you see him in the top image in a similar hat, similar building in the background, similar kind of clothes, blonde wig, the beard, and kind of trying to capture, trying to act out uh, Cindy's role here. I think though what he misses is that here's another example of a man taking the place of a woman. So his interpretation seems to be downplaying the feminist themes in her work and also is kind of putting the male gaze back into the work here with him as the star that we're admiring. So it, it seems to me like he doesn't really get the original work and maybe why this wasn't good work to appropriate. So what is this performance art stuff? Uh, performance art is presented to an audience live. It's usually unscripted. It can be scripted, but generally unscripted. And then sometimes you have participation, sometimes you don't. Chris Burden is one of the early performance artists who kind of sets up what it is. Another one is the artist Marina Abramovic. So Br Bramovic here in 1977 is performing in Ponderbilia with her boyfriend at the time, Ule. They have closed the doorway to get into the art space 
and are standing naked and nude, silently facing each other. This means that for anyone that comes into the art space, they have to brush up against both of their nude bodies. And this presents, you know, presents a conundrum of the comfortable physical space that you like to have between people, and also maybe the erotic possibilities of brushing up against one gender and possibly the repulsive qualities of brushing up against another gender. When this piece happened, the Italian government ultimately stopped the show and arrested them. And later on, when Marina has a show at MoMA, uh, a, a, a retrospective, she has actors doing her performances and nobody is arrested. So the idea is, is that we know what art is now. We know what performance art is. People get nude in these spaces. Now, getting nude in public is a radical act that can get you arrested. However, being nude in a place where it's understood that there might be nude bodies, that is okay. That is a, a guaranteed kind of freedom of expression that adults can have in private spaces. Shia LaBeouf and Marina Abramovic again. So Shia is a child actor, struggled a little bit becoming an adult actor, and in that tough time, he plagiarized a story that he said that he was writing, got caught on the internet, and responded by not saying, hey, I'm sorry, I'm going through a tough time. Responded by putting a bag over his head on the red carpets and saying, I am not famous anymore. Didn't really work. So he then did a show at an art space where he sat in a room with a bodyguard and you were allowed one at a time to be in the room with him for about a minute. In the room, he was either wearing the bag and sobbing, there was a bottle of whiskey there and a whip, and you had a couple of moments alone with this actor. The things that I thought when I saw this, uh, I guess he has uh, the implements like a whip to a vase of daisy. I don't know of anybody whipping him, by the way. Uh, there was a bodyguard there. So he stares in silence, sometimes sobbing un uncontrollably. When I saw this, I thought of Marina Abramovic's Rhythm Zero, which we see in the bottom images. Rhythm Zero is done in the 70s. Marina is in a room full of people in the gallery, and she is a living sculpture. And for a time period that she sets up, you are allowed to do anything you want with her. So you can pose her, uh, she has implements also that include a feather duster, um, that include, there's a, a revolver and a bullet that is separate from the revolver. There's a pair of scissors. So it starts kind of playfully with people moving her, setting her in chairs and stuff, and she doesn't do anything to resist. She set up these rules. Then it starts to get a little bit darker. The audience cuts her clothes off. The audience member, somebody cuts her face with the scissors. They cut her jugular vein and they drink some blood out of her neck. And then one person that you see here put a bullet in the gun, put the gun up to her neck and made her hold it. And that is when the gallerist ran into the room, took the gun and threw it out the window. So when she did this, she did this for everybody to see. Uh, it was dangerous, and she put up with it, no bodyguards. And how does she respond to Shia taking her work? And she says, it's so manipulative, it's so complicated to answer. It's very interesting to me to go, that the Hollywood world wants to go back to performance, which is something so different from what they are doing. Maybe they need our experience, maybe they need simplicity, maybe they need to be connected with the direct public, which you know being a Hollywood actor doesn't permit you. So again, between James Franco, between Shia, we see that actors aren't necessarily that good at making art. I found an article discussing the differences between actors and musicians making art. 
And the article says that rock stars are usually better at painter at being painters. Uh, Bob Dylan in the bottom, he is part of the Gagosian Gallery in Beverly Hills. He does these watercolors of him in the tour bus as he's traveling across America, you know, doing performance dates, hundreds of them. So it's a very kind of lonely experience, and the watercolors have a little bit of a shakiness to it that you might have from trying to paint while you're on a moving vehicle. Actors seem to have a tougher time. In the above image, we have Jim Carrey, and this guy, Jonathan Jones, he really kind of bashes Carrey for this video that you'll see here. Uh, I'm not going to play it, but you can, you can see it on the PDF. Jim Carrey had some personal problems, started painting, put out a video of his paintings, and it was very earnest, very serious. But the work was kind of so bad, and the way he was talking about the work, you weren't sure if, it was, if he was serious or if maybe this was a role he, and he was putting us on. So he, now let me, let me just say this, painting is all about persistence. Anyone can learn how to paint if you do it for years. And Jim Carrey has been making pretty good paintings, I think, in the last few years. He's gotten better at it. I'm not so sure he should have rushed out this video of him painting so quick. And again, why would anyone be interested in Jim Carrey's paintings? Not because he's an artist, but because you're curious, well, how does this comedic actor paint? And the idea that he might get a show in a gallery that might belong to an artist who has spent more of their life and has more merit in art is a little bit hard to stomach from an artist's point of view. Now, there is a L.A. artist that came kind of respected for his photographs, Dennis Hopper. Dennis Hopper is, uh, was an independent filmmaker who helped made the movie Easy Rider that created an entire independent movie craze in the early 70s. He is an actor who starred in a lot of really good films. And he spent his time in Los Angeles with a camera. He was a competent photographer. And he was documenting the world around him. Uh, you see Jane Fonda probably in his backyard with a bow and arrow. We see outlaw bikers in the top image. Those outlaw bikers that Hopper was hanging around with that helped him make this convincing movie of Outlaw Bikers in Easy Rider. So he was also hanging around artists. He was hanging around the original important artists in Los Angeles, the Ferris Gallery and the Cool School. So he knew art, he hung around art, he understood photography, and he documented his truth. He documented the world around him. And the photographs are okay. I've seen them several times. This is kind of what I was talking about earlier in the lecture. This is Jeffrey Deach. Here's James Franco. And this is where Mocha makes a mistake in thinking that people in L.A. want to see celebrities and art. And ultimately, we don't. It's one of those things that we kind of try to stay separate. So Mocha, their board was made up of artists. It's known as an artist museum. And these artists... People that we've seen, John Baldessari, conceptual art, uh, Ed Ruscha, we saw him in printmaking, Barbara Kruger, we've seen her artwork. Uh, we will look at Catherine Opie's photographs. All four of these artists have been part of our class, or will be part of our class. And they all resigned from the board when Deitch started. So Deitch says that we're going to create a new model of how to present a solo show of a contemporary artist. There were a couple of shows that I liked. The Art in the Street show was a massive street art show, and as a graffiti artist, I really enjoyed the show and how big it was. But many of his shows maybe weren't doing so well. He was hard to get along with. He wasn't a traditional curator, and I think the people working at MoCA really did not like working for him. So ultimately, he gets fired pretty quickly, and they replace him with a typical trained curator. And you can see the more typical kind of abstract modern paintings behind him. And I believe uh, that Vern, 
Vergne uh, also has been let go, and there's a new curator now. Mocha is still kind of struggling after Paul Schimmel, one of the greatest curators in L.A. history. So what I would like you to do is I'd like you to take a look at the assignment here. So we got Chris Burden. You might want to watch the whole video of Chris Burden. Some of his performances are crazy. Uh, he nearly kills himself consistently in these, in these performances. Bed piece is pretty benign. So I want you to kind of compare what you've learned about an artist like Chris and, and, and actors doing performance art. Do you think that musicians might be better than artists to make art? Is it because they play instruments? Uh, rather than actors who, if they don't write, are just kind of waiting to become whatever they're told or directed to do. Maybe it's harder for them to find their own space. And then the third question I have is, is there a celebrity that you'd like to see make art? And uh, I'd like to know why you'd think that they'd be interesting uh, to see them make art. So that would be our discussion, and uh, I hope that you uh, enjoy it. I think it's got some fun qualities to it, and I'll talk to you soon.